Good day, everybody. Welcome to Stay Home and Wind Down, a program of the Maryland Wineries Association. I'm Kevin Addix, Executive Director, and tonight we are talking about dry white wines. The, the, uh, the dry white pack was one of seven different packs that we uh, had up for sale, and customers were able to pick from mystery packs, and they got four uh, out of potentially six different wines that our team had pulled together, some of our favorites, some really interesting things, some stunners, some brand new or, or, or uh, interesting varieties. So uh, we've got a, as we've had all along, really great panelists uh, tonight. And we also have a great moderator. I'd like to bring up Michael Kaiser from Wine America. Michael, welcome. Hey, Kevin, thanks for having me. Yeah, glad you could be here. And uh, you're joining us from DC where you are keeping a watch over all of the shenanigans on Capitol Hill to make sure that uh, good things happen and bad things don't. Right, I'm here in my uh, my relatively small backyard on uh, the eastern part of Capitol Hill. Um, and yeah, it's it's been an interesting three and a half months, obviously for everybody, but here too, uh, trying to do the, my best for the industry. Uh, you know, for those of you that may not know, our organization is a, the National Trade Association. So we work on behalf of not just Maryland wineries, but all wineries uh, that are members or not members uh, from across the country. So it's uh, it's not an easy task, um, as you well know, Kevin, from running a trade association. Yeah. So, um, but you know, it's it, it has perks. I get to do stuff like this. Uh, you know, obviously, I've become passionate about Maryland wine over the years. I've been lucky to have you invite me to judge some of your competitions. And when you asked me to do this, I I jumped at this chance, and I think you know. White wine in particular, I think is a way uh, there, you know, wines across the board have gotten better, but obviously, you know, I think white wine allows a lot of the um, grapes that you may not think of to shine a little bit more, particularly here on the East Coast and Mid-Atlantic, like the Albarino we're just about to talk about. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing what's happened with, with our white wines over the last 10, 15 years. We have new varieties, as I mentioned before, but just the, the, the honing of varietal character and just the, the beautiful wines that are being produced has really, I mean, it, it, it's been amazing to me. And, and that's as someone who's been in the industry tasting wines, uh, you know, uh, each of these wines, I probably get to taste two or three times a year. And it's amazing just the increase in quality and just how beautiful these are. So uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Now you have, you mentioned judging in Maryland's competitions. You are a bit of a jet setter. You've tasted around all around the country as well. Yes, yes. I've I've only done I've judged in Maryland and I've judged in, in Colorado competition. Uh, I did that last year, but yeah, I've had I've been be able to taste wine from all over. Uh, you know, one of the highlights, as you well know, is that we do every year is we do the big uh, American wine tasting on Capitol Hill, which unfortunately we couldn't do this year. Uh, we were supposed to do it in the first week of this month, actually, and I think uh, what uh, the second, I believe, is when we were supposed right. to do it and. You know, that's we get wine from about 25 different states, three or four producers from each state. Uh, you know, and it's people always ask, you know, one of the things that I've asked if, like, if I'm like an expert, if you will. And I honestly tell people, it's like, I only drink American wine. I don't really, I couldn't tell you one thing about French wine. I mean, I could tell you about the grapes, but I don't know any producers there. So, but it's, it's a wonderful industry. And I, I you know, being able to, tr the way, you know, an Albarino in Maryland might taste different than an Albarino from, say, Washington is just, Yep. It's an interesting uh, dichotomy, and I, it's one of the more enjoyable things about this job is being able to meet the people and try all the wines from different parts of the country. And and try all the wines you do. So this is, yes, this, I this do. is a good yes. thing. Um, let's bring in our panelists just to say hello. I'm going to pull everybody up here on the screen in no particular order. So welcome, everybody. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Thank hello. you. Nice to be here. So, uh, so Finn DeFord from Bordy Vineyards, top right of the screen. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about Bordy. Yeah, it's, it's hard to get oriented on the screen. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the winery. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Phineas DeFord. I'm with Bordy Vineyards. We are located in Baltimore County. That's where our home vineyard is and our winery that is on our family's 250-acre farm. Uh, we are Maryland's oldest winery, established in 1945. My family purchased the winery in 1980 and moved it uh, here to our farm. So we operate uh, the winery, as I said, with about 18 acres of grapes on this location and then another vineyard in Frederick County 
um, where we grow our albuminators, what we're talking about today, uh, on the side of um, South Mountain. And that vineyard is about 25 acres. And um, happy to be here and talk about wine. Great job. Nothing better. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of love for the work here. That's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, bottom left, Jason Burris from Antietam Creek Vineyards out in Washington County. Jason, welcome. Hello. There. So uh, thanks for having me. Again, uh, my name is Jason. Uh, with, uh, so I'm the winemaker at Antietam Creek Vineyards and also a wine production consultant. Uh, consult for five wineries in Virginia and Maryland. And I'm here to talk to you today about the Chardonnay from 2017 in Washington County, Antietam Creek Vineyards. There we go. There's the bottle right here. So Antietam Creek Vineyards is a small, it's a micro winery. Uh, we're only about four acres and produce about 850 cases of wine. And the Chardonnay represents about 125 cases of wine. Uh, so very small production. Um, but we're growing. Uh, we're seeing good things with the business and with the traffic we're seeing and, and the reception to our wines. So thanks again for having me. Yeah, glad, glad, very glad to have you and, and super excited to uh, have folks get to know that wine. Bob White from Robin Hill Vineyards, uh, Farm and Vineyards down in Brandywine. Bob, welcome. Thank you for having us today. So tell us, tell us a little bit about Robin Hill. Uh, Robin Hill Farm and Vineyards uh, has been here since 1955 when my wife's family actually purchased the farm, her mom and dad. Uh, it's gone through several transitions of agriculture, uh, starting with tobacco and hogs and then uh, nursery and pumpkins and agritourism. And now where we are today with, uh, with the wedding barn and our winery and vineyard, of course. Uh, we have five acres of vineyards. We grow six different varieties. Uh, we are a very small winery, uh, about anywhere it's from 1,200 to 1,500 cases of wine a year. Um, and uh, award-winning wine, I may want to add. We, we've taken our, uh, brought home some, some, some metal to hang on the walls, so we're, we're happy about that. And um, come and see us down in Brandywine. And uh, today we'll be talking about our uh, MD32, which is a 100% uh, Chardonnay, uh, and our label uh, represents a uh, tobacco plant uh, showing it's part of our heritage. So we're very much about our heritage and uh, telling our story when you come and visit us. So come on down and see us here at Robin Hill. And Bob, uh, thank you for that. But let, let, let's clear this up. Everything that we're talking about in these many different uh, wine virtual tastings, they're all covered in bling, right? <laughs> all, all of these wines are award-winning. Somebody has loved these wines, uh, scored these wines, written about these wines, or, or flung medals at these wines. So, and and who knows? It might have been Michael Kaiser who's been a judge in the competition. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Luck, lucky strike. So, um, with that, uh, Melissa Allen, thanks for joining us from Linganore Wine Cellars. Yeah, most certainly. No problem. Um, so my name is Melissa Allen. I am the third generation winemaker here at Linganore. Uh, my family bought the farm back in 1971, started the winery in 76. Uh, my grandma, who's almost 90, uh, still lives on the property and she's still the owner of the business. Uh, my dad and my uncle run the winery. My uncle's the vineyard manager and my dad's in charge of winemaking and tasting room, uh, more of the day to day operations. Um, and then I do everything they don't do. I think it's probably the best way to sum that up. Um, so I'm heavy handed in the winemaking now with our head winemaker, Ray Mitchum, and uh, kind of do a whole bunch of whatever else needs to be done around the farm. Uh, we have been around now for 44 years and um, well known in the industry for our sweet wines, uh, and, but we've made a drastic shift in the last, I'll call it five to eight years of focusing more on the dry wine quality and it's really shown. So I'm excited to be here today and talk to you about something that I'm passionate about making, um, probably my favorite hybrid to work with, which is the 2019 Vignol, um, later on in the, in the um, broadcast. Very cool. So we've got the state's two oldest wineries here and we've got uh, the, the younger generations from both of those wineries involved as well, which is very cool. So thank you, Melissa. And uh, let's go back to Michael 
Um, Michael, we uh, we have some wines to taste. We do. I've been uh, I've been trying them for the, about the last uh, hour. Um, I've been unfortunately I have to spit most of them. Obviously, want to be coherent for this. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And you know, it's it's. I, I think these are all great examples uh, of what white wine can be in Maryland. From you know, just a pure stainless steel uh, wine like this Albarino we're about to talk about, and then the the oak on the um, Antietam Creek just really accents that Chardonnay really perfectly. So, I, yeah, I think this is, you know, and then to be talking about a couple hybrids, too. We're going to be talking about uh, Chardonnay and um, there is, let's see, uh, some, tr what is, oh, oh Vignol, obviously. Vignol, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's something that, that I, th I, I hope you're going to ask some questions about as we go through just the, the history yeah. and tradition of hybrids in Maryland. So you wanted to head to the Albarino first? Yeah, let's go with the Albarino, and then I think we should do Robin Hill, then Langanor, then Antietam Creek. All right, well, let's bring Finn back up, and I will drop. All right, hey, hey Finn, how are you? Hey, good, Michael. There's a, you'll have to bear with me. My daughter just joined me. There's a scary part in Moana, so she's. Uh, oh, yeah. Up. I think I know that part, actually. Um, it's one of, that's one of our favorites here in this, uh, in this house. So, yeah, as Kevin said, thanks for joining us. Obviously, you know, I've known your family and the winery for a long time. Full disclosure here, I'm a wine club member at Bordy, have been for about five years now. And, you know, let's talk about this wine. I mean, you, I think Albarino has really been a star for you guys. And I think there's actually a misprint on the screen. It's, this is actually the 18 we're talking about, not the 19. Has the 19 That's been right. released yet? We have not released the 19 yet. Nope, okay. got to get through the 18 first, which we're, which we, um, I mean, just, yeah. so uh, there you yeah, go. Next, not quite there yet. Um, um, Tell us about the, your, your, your planting of Albarino. Why did you plant it? Uh, tell us a little bit about South Mountain, a little bit more detail about the, the, uh, the vineyard. Just sure. Yeah, so um, we, we had this beautiful ground to plant in South Mountain, uh, which is our vineyard in Frederick County. That's gonna have her join me. Ah. And um, we were trying, it was an east facing slope. So it was a pool site. We knew reds weren't gonna do well there. And so we, we were trying to find a, a white that was suitable. We'd already planted a little bit of Chardonnay. We tasted a few Albarinos from the state, from around the state. We knew they were quite nice. We were impressed by them. We also happened to have a Spanish uh, enologist on our team named Jose Real. And he's very familiar with the grape. Of course, it comes from his, uh, near his hometown of Jerez. And so he recommended we take a serious look at it. He noticed some similarities in the climates between uh, Rios Baixas and, and uh, Maryland. So we, we started doing our research. We visited several wineries in Virginia, tasted their Albarinos, both tasted some from Maryland, a few from Pennsylvania, and we really liked what we found. A lot of different styles uh, with just one grape, which really intrigued us. So we uh, went for it. We, we planted four acres of uh, the same clone, clone, clone one. And, um, and it's just, as you said, it's really been a star for us. So we, we didn't quite know what to expect, but um, it's a beautiful grape. It's, it's highly aromatic. It's a great producer. It's very vigorous, so it's difficult to manage, at least the claim that we have. Uh, but it's uh, just, as I said, beautifully aromatic. Um, it's quickly become one of our best-selling wines. And um, I think if we could make and grow and sell one, one grape, this Albarino would be it. Uh, it's, it's okay, good. It's, um, <laughs> scary part's over. Um, it's a very versatile grape. We can make a, you know, a barrel fermented style, which we do. Uh, so we, that's our Albarino Reserve, which we uh, ferment and age in barrel. This is our stainless steel version. Um, so we can turn this around pretty quickly. Uh, it's just, you know, again, preserve some of those really beautiful aromas, um, classic aromas of white peaches, and stone fruits. It's just um, year in and year out a great producer, even in a difficult year like 2018, uh, which I don't think is any secret. The Mid-Atlantic was a, was a tough year. This, this vineyard just really produced beautiful fruit, albeit not, not as much as in other years. Um, but again, we, I think this is a great example of a quality wine made in a difficult vintage in the mid -Atlantic. Now, do you think from a marketing standpoint, it was hard to get people to, they, they didn't know what it was, you know, Bordy had been known for, for Chardonnay, obviously, and Pinot Gris. Uh, I think you called it Pinot Grigio back then. But, um, you know, what, what was the, was it a hard sell or just, you know, it was because of the, the relatively low price point and the, 
the the quality of it do you think it was easy to get the consumer to kind of latch on to it yeah we didn't see we were worried about that we thought about calling it various different names but in the end we wanted to stick with what it's what it's known as and um right out of the gates i just think that the quality of the wine spoke for itself and um you know the key is to get good wine in people's glasses and if they like it they can butcher the name all they want but they're going to keep buying it in this case um in this case that that's exactly what happened um and you know one of the one of the unforeseen um, things that happens when you when you release a new wine like this and it sort of takes off is sometimes it can cannibalize sales from some of your other wines and so yeah uh, we see a little bit of that you know our, our chardonnay our pinot gris some of those other wines that, that we've that we've built up quite a following with took a little bit of a hit but in the end it all balances out and now people know how to pronounce it they love buying it it's i think competitively priced and no issues no issues with the name and so you mentioned the um yeah i know you do the, the reserve which is barrel fermented how do you choose which grapes go into which yeah uh so we this our site is pretty unique in the sense that it has these very rocky uh low fertility ridges that run down the the, the slope and so we've identified those areas as sort of our reserve sites. They're pretty easy to identify. Um, you never need to hedge them. You never need to do basically anything to the vine. There's no weeds growing there. It's really, uh, we call them our dry bench sections and they're really just uh, without basically doing anything to, the, to those sections produce fruit of extraordinary quality. Um, and it's not to say that the rest of the vineyard uh, is, you know, doesn't, but um, if we have to identify certain portions, that's what we, we, we set aside for the reserve program. And some of that, you know, we can only make so much of a reserve uh, bottling, so uh, there's always some extra, and of course that will go right into this wine. And I, I think it's also, um, oh, Kevin's telling us we need to taste now, so one more question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you think, you know, do you think, Albert, you know, thinking more generally about the grape, um, do you do you think Albarino? I mean, I, I'm not one to, to go for signature grapes for a region or anything like that, unless you really can, like in Willamette Valley with Pinot. I mean, do you think Albarino has that kind of, well, uh, you know, it could be something like that for Maryland or even the Mid Atlantic to hang its hat on as, as for the future? Do you think that there should be more plantings of it? Yeah, I, I certainly think so. And, you know, you mentioned earlier you've tasted Albarinos from all around the country and how different they can be. Well, I've tasted mm -hmm. them all, all around Maryland and they're different. Um, yeah, that's right. That, um, that's one of the really fun things about this grape. Um, I know Fort of Leonardtown has made one uh, that I really enjoyed. Linganore makes Linganore makes a beautiful one uh, for Black Ankle, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they've all just been really pleasing wines to me and, and very different. Um, so I think when you can find a grape like that, uh, you know, I agree. Signature wine, I don't know, but um, in terms of white wines. It's it's been one of the most consistently pleasing wines that I've tasted from that. Yeah, I've had even some as far from the Hudson Valley and and the Finger Lakes. Yeah. There's a winery in the Finger Lakes right on the water that can grow it, and it's it's really such a versatile grape. All right, yeah. Kevin, we can taste now. <laughs> We're done talking. <laughs> so, what do we uh, what do we all think of? The, obviously, this is very aromatic, and. You know, you're getting a lot of tropical fruit. Uh, it's, you know, I'm thinking that this is, the, it just really is the quintessential summer white wine for me, I think. Um, and for, particularly if you're pairing it with anything from the Bay. I, I mean, I, I think, would you, would you agree with that, Finn? Like, this is the perfect, obviously in Spain, you know, this is, you know, the, this is the seafood wine. I mean, would you say that that's the case here too? Totally. Although I would agree with anything. Totally yeah no i i it, it's it's hard uh to find something that doesn't pair well with albarino but uh seafood is certainly a go-to um great summer wine uh we grilled some octopus the other night just went beautifully with this calamari of course crab you know we're in maryland so crab rockfish um but it's just that that bracing acidity on the end really pairs so nicely with with uh, a wide variety of seafood dishes yeah um, I'll give you just a couple of nerdy details for those who care. Uh, we, Please we do. This, yep, we picked this in uh, early September. It's usually one of our first varieties that we pick. Uh, it came in at about 22 and a half bricks. Um, it finished with a pH of 3.57, TA around 6.46, 12% uh, alcohol. It's, 100%, it's totally dry. 
Um, again, it was uh, fermented entirely in stainless steel and Saccharomyces, uh, no ML, um, no no acid addition. So it's one of those one of those grapes for us, which you, you really um, don't have to do anything to it once it comes in the winery. The way it grows in the vineyard, it just tells you, as a especially as a grape grower, that it's perfectly suited for for our site and for this climate. And again, our site is very rocky site, eastern slope, but the rows are facing north south, um, and it just loves it there. If anything, it's a little little vigorous. We got to hedge it a lot, but um, it's pretty easy to manage. It tendrils to the to the um, catch wires very easily, and so once we've gotten it up, we can just hedge it and forget it. So it's really, a, really a dream grape. If we can grow 100 acres of it and sell it all, we would. Um, and you, are you still at the four? Have you added more in, or is it still just the four acres? We're, we're only at the four. Yeah, we're pretty much planted out, so we need some more ground before we can plant more. And before we move on to the next one, I have one last question. Um, yeah, South, South Mountain. Do you think that they'll ever? Have you ever thought about petitioning for the TTB for an AVA for American Viticultural Area for that? I mean, there's a couple. I mean, the Antietam Creek is 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 from that area too. I mean, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we it actually is in the uh, Catoctin Viticultural District. It is um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've actually going forward are going to start using that AVA on our label. Okay. Um, there were some issues with TTB um, in using that and some of the language we had on our on our front label. Um, right, yeah. Going forward, we're we're going to start using that ABA. Okay, and just yeah. so those uh, who may be listening, the TTB is the uh, abbreviation for the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, which is the part of the Treasury Department that regulates the wine and other alcohol industries here in the U.S. And so, there's your little bit of bureaucracy trivia for today, <laughs> among the uh, the fun wine tasting we're having. So, well, Finn, thanks for thanks for sharing the wine. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Cheers. Always wonderful to talk to you and always wonderful to have your wines. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Kevin. And and uh, thanks for the cameo from your daughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Where to next? Let's, t uh, let's talk Robin Hill. Excellent. So we'll pull up Bob White from Robin Hill Vineyards. Hello. Hi there. How you doing? Good. So I, as I, with Finn, I have a couple questions for you to kind of talk about your winery and the vineyards and your wine. So first of all, tell me about Chardonnay. What is Chardonnay? Why did you plant it? What do you think about it? Chardonnay is a uh, hybrid. We'll start with that. And it is a cross between Chardonnay and Saval Blanc. Um, I started growing Chardonnay at my uh, previous vineyard uh, up in Manchester, up in Northern Maryland. And it uh, just as an experimental uh, grape that I was comparing to Chardonnay for uh, for the University of Maryland under Joe Fiola. Uh, we did grow a lot of grapes for Joe uh, up there uh, in, in our experimental blocks to see what would work in that region. Um, so I liked it. And then when uh, we started the vineyard down here in Southern Maryland, where it is so hot, um, we figured that Chardonnay would uh, handle the heat a lot better than Chardonnay down here because regular Chardonnay would just melt down here. Our humidity and our heat, it doesn't cool down at night. We don't get that 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 change in, in fluctuation in the temperatures that that uh, the thin skinned grapes need. Chardonnay is a, a, a heftier grape. Uh, it's got a thicker skin, uh, can tolerate more disease resistance, and it does fantastic down here in Southern Maryland. It, it really can withstand the uh, uh, I would say brutal <laughs> climate we have to grow grapes in down here uh, for lack of better words. And how many acres of it do you have planted? Um, we have probably about three quarters of an acre. Like I said, we only have about five acres and I have six varieties. So they're, they're, they're kind of okay. split up evenly. So um, yeah, so we make a, we can do about 350 gallons a year out of our, uh, out of our, our vineyard. And we try to keep everything um, you know, estate as far as the right. Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about this wine in particular. What uh, mm -hmm. is there, what characteristics of, of the um, growing? What were the characteristics of the growing season? You know, how did um, you know? Is there any? I assume. Well, so the, the description that I've given here doesn't really talk too <laughs> much about 2019. wine. This is 2017. We're talking about. 
Okay. Um, but the uh, uh, our, our standard with the uh, Chardonnay is uh, stainless steel fermentation. We uh, keep it at uh, uh, under a temperature controlled fermentation, so we don't let it get too warm. I, I keep it, you know, below seventy degrees during fermentation, sixty five where I like to keep my, my fermentation going, uh, standard Saccharomyces and, 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 and that. Um, what I really like about it is the outcome. Uh, we have a nice citrus, uh, almost a, a lemony citrus uh, pear kind of, of flavor. And we get a nice floral aroma in it too. So it's, it's a, a very pleasant wine um, for those who like a dry white wine. There are those who, who don't like uh, dry wines, but for those who enjoy a nice dry white wine, a little citrus bite to it, um, this is this is my oyster wine. I'll tell you what, we're doing seafood, crab yeah. cake, or oysters. This this is where I hit right here. Yeah, in in all total honesty, I've, it's certainly it's not been one of my favorite grapes throughout uh, over the years, but this is okay. definitely a good and well done. Um, Thank you example of what the grape can do if, if handled properly and you know i think when people think hybrids they think they're going to be weird or you know the term that we hear is is boxy or gamey i mean and from a the marketing standpoint of things and then I, we have a question about your cork um enclosure um what you know is it do you, is the consumer is it a hard sell to get them to be open about trying a hybrid wine do people get confused and think this is some sort of weird Chardonnay? I mean, w tell us about the the, the hand the, the selling of this, if you could. Um, the selling of this, we, we we promote it as a dry white. But first, they have to get over that whether they like dry or not. Once they are on board with with going with dry, then then we promote the seafood, the uh, the citrus, the lemon. Um, this is going to go great with your with your crab cakes and and. That's 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 a big push right there. You know, we are in Southern Maryland. We are in, you know, seafood country down here, and people are looking for good wine to go with their seafood. So we 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 promote that. We push that, and um, and it's no lie. It it, it is fantastic with our uh, with our culinary folks uh, down here, and um, it's just very crisp. Um, it's refreshing. It, it really is a very refreshing wine. With, without the the uh, the sugar, um, that you know, it's very highly sought after with a lot of wines. Um, this is just dry and, and and very nice. If you like the seventeen, wait until we release our eighteen. Blows the seventeen back? away. Our our eighteen vintage. Let me let me tell you a little bit about that. Eighteen was a horrible year for grapes. Right. Uh huh. Fortunately, the the thing with uh, Chardonnay is that it is ready to pick early in the season. So in 18, our harvest date was the uh, the end of August, before all the real harsh uh, weather hit us. We got it off early and it just, 18 just is just fantastic. I can't wait to release it. We've got a few cases of 17 left. Once that's gone, that 18 is coming out and our 18 just blows the 17 away. It's just, there's no comparison. So, we had a, a question come in about your your closure here. Um, was it a uh, is it an artificial cork, and why why do you choose that um, over say a screw cap or, or, or a um, a natural cork? I have a I have an hour on this if you really want to talk about it. But, uh, <laughs> it's not my question. That's so I, I, I knew that too. So that's why I wasn't going to ask about that. But all right. So our, our closure is uh, is from a company named Norma Cork. Mm -hmm. And um, they are a sugarcane based uh, cork closure. Uh, it's a sugarcane based polymer that they use. And um, it looks like cork, acts like cork, except you don't need to keep it wet like cork. Um, there are different grades of this uh, particular uh, cork. And I use different, there's like a 100 series, a 300 series, and a 500 series that I use in my wines uh the 100 series is a tighter grain to we i can have better control of my uh oxygen transfer rate is what it's called of the air that goes through the cork into the bottle uh, while it's aging 
my white wines, I don't want a lot of air to go through. With natural cork, you don't know what you're going to get. Every cork is different. Every cork is going to have a different amount of oxygen transfer rate. That's why a lot of your white wines with natural cork can't can't rest out the the, the, the length of time. Uh, they say, you got to drink your white wines within five years or they go bad. Mm-hmm. That's because the cork's bleeding air into it. With our uh, with the uh, uh, synthetic cork, it's not really synthetic. It's uh, the cork, uh, sugarcane based cork. Um, I know exactly how much air is going in. I my vacuum system when we cork the wines, I, I get all the air out. We put the cork in. Now I know what my oxygen transfer rate is, so my wines will last the test of time. And so, and the, the you know Marcy is her name who asked the question. Don't worry, it's not sensitive. There is a lot of debate about it. Um, I think one of the things that some people might not realize is that when you have a quote unquote artificial cork, it, it's more than likely made from natural substances. So, right, right. Yeah. So ours is sugar cane. And yeah. if you, I mean, a lot of wine right now that if you, you look at the red wines, they still have traditional cork and they're white wines, just like you were talking about. They're either a screw cap or they're using a, a, a non cork based cork, if you will. Uh, for their closure. And I think there's, I mean, you said it right away. It, you, you're not going to hold on to particularly a white like this too much longer than where it is right now. I think it's drinking lovely right now. Um, but still, you're not going to hold on to it too much longer. The, uh, we use the, we use the Norma cork in all our wines, our reds, our whites. I just use different grades for different oxygen transfer rates. Um, you know, the reds, I want them to mature a little more in a bottle. So I use a little bit looser cork. It let a little more oxygen through to, to do more bottle aging. Like I said, with the whites, I keep them tight. And, you know, I, I have I have control of my oxygen at that point. And this, this wine is 100% Chardonnay? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. And real quick, before we move on to the next wine, what other grapes are you are you growing and making wine from? Uh, we have, uh, with our whites, uh, Chenin Blanc. We have uh, Vidal Blanc. We have, uh, let's see, with our reds, uh, uh, Chamberson, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc. Um, I also want to add with our, uh, with the Chardonnay, it's also a good blender. Um, We've just uh, released, uh, last week, we released our brand new uh, vintage blend. It's our first white blend. And we blended uh, Viognier with our Chardonnay and a little bit of our Chenin Blanc. And that's a killer wine. Let me tell you what. Sounds, yeah. Sounds lovely. Yeah. It's, it's very good. Very you're good. Not far, and, and you're not far from DC. I'll have to come take a uh, take a trip out and take. Uh, yeah, we're only like a half an hour. So, yeah, come on down and, uh, and join us. Great. Well, thanks for joining us and talking about your wonderful wine today. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thanks. Kevin. Oh, hey, back. I'm here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a very cool grape. And Bob, I'm glad you mentioned that you're growing uh, Chenin Blanc. Yeah, which that's is a really rare, cool. Yeah, it's a rarity in Maryland, and uh, it's quite delicious. So I'm, I'm hoping that hoping that spreads. All right. So up next, the Linganore. Next up, Linganore. So another uh, hybrid. Another another hybrid, Melissa. Ooh, and hybrids. and before, hybrids. before I put it up here, since I've gotten all of the vintages wrong thus far, what vintage is this? <laughs> is this 2019? <laughs> it is 2019. It is 2019. 2019. Yeah. You got it. Well, hello. How are you? Thanks for joining hey, us. Hey, how are you? Yeah, no problem. Last, I think the last time I saw you was at that big tasting last summer. Um, yeah, we did the... Yep. Yes, certainly. And yeah, that was, a, we, that was a great day. <laughs> I believe we actually might have had the 2018 uh, version of this, if, if memory serves. I, might, I could be did. wrong. Yes. Yep, we did. You're right. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about Vignole. Why do you like it? How does it grow on your property? What is it, first of all? Sure. So what is it is a great question. So as a um, intellectual body of viticulturalists, we really don't know. Um, we used to think it was something called Revat 51, but after years of testing, it seems like it's not Revat 51. So we're not really sure where it is or how it really came to be, but it's here as a hybrid. And another good term for hybrids um, that I've started using is called multi-heritage. Because yeah. hybrid in lots of people's minds comes up as like a GMO, right? It's so like painted as like a word, 
but if you use multi-heritage, it just comes from many different different parents, right? So it's a multi-heritage grape as opposed to your pure Vitis vinifera, which is directly um, from Europe, which by the way, in and of themselves are hybrids, but we won't go on to that conversation. So this is a <laughs> multi-heritage. We don't have that much time. No, we don't. <laughs> um, We've had this on our property now for probably about 10 or 12 years. Uh, we've got one older block, probably about three quarters to an acre uh, that's been around for a while. And then we've also got a younger block that's on its fourth leaf this year. Last year was its third leaf and it grows so well for us that we actually cropped it on its second leaf, which is know, a pretty big deal. We were just happy to get grapes on its second year instead of having to wait till the third year. Um, of course, the second year was 2018, so it was kind of, eh. yeah. But we did it anyway. Um, the grapes did really well with it. Um, and the berries are big, on, aren't they, for vignoles? No, no. They're, they're I'm thinking small. of Vidal Blanc. You're thinking of Vidal Blanc. Yeah, these are small and tight clustered. So we do run into a lot of issues, um, like many people do with Pinot Gris, because Pinot Gris is the same idea. Small berries, tight cluster. And when you've got those tight clusters, it leads to a lot of issues in the vineyard. It can lead to a lot of issues in the vineyard, especially in hot and humid climates because you don't get enough air circulation through the cluster to dry it out after the morning dew. And so you can end up with a lot of disease pressure, mildews, fungi, uh, fungus and everything growing inside the clusters themselves. Um, so we do struggle with that a little bit. Uh, also, it's a more of an early variety for us. So when I was talking um, pre-broadcast, we were talking about frost. This was one of those varieties that we had about 5% damage in because it was already out a little bit sooner than that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so um, when does this, you know, when, you, when this is, like, when is this usually ready to be harvested? At what point during the, is it one of the early grapes, later grapes? Yeah. yeah. So our, since we have two different blocks, they harvest at different times, right? The older block takes a little bit more longer to mature. The younger block spikes up quickly. Uh, and so the younger block for this year, we picked on uh, the 27th of August. It was our second grape we picked. And then the older block we picked on the 6th of September. So almost a week later, over a week later, we picked the older block. Um, just because of the time needed to to ripen it to the where we were looking for. Um, now, do you? I, this is a hundred. This is bone dry. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, do you do? You know, a lot of wineries here in the U.S. that make this grape, they do it in a, a sweeter style, or it might be done like a like a, a late harvest. And if in the, in the Finger Lakes in New York, they'll do it late harvest, or yep. even ice cream in some cases. Like, do you do? Do you? Is it always been dry for you? What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you ever do any oak? treatment on this is this is there oak in this oh there is there is um, there is oak in this. what yeah. is the like what is the oak treatment on this and how do you decide what you're going to do with the grape sure so that's a very good point like vignola as a grape is extremely acidic it carries a lot of acid it comes in for all you wine nerds out there the ta is usually 1.1 1.2 it's really high um ta ph moderate but it's ta more than what you pick up in your mouth um and so most of the wineries in the united states make this wine as either semi-sweet, off dry or semi-sweet is usually how you find this, this wine more than anything else. Um, we don't do that. Uh, we used to blend it into a larger blend we call Terrapin White. Uh, we have since moved from that and made Vignola its own thing. So right now it goes through fermentation in tank and we use two different yeasts. We do use R2 and VL1, which are two very aromatic um, and like floral inducing yeasts. And then after that, it's aged in both, and this this wine in particular is aged in fourth year, second year, and third year barrels. Yeah. Um, so those barrels are not new oak, but they do have some oak, and you're getting a little bit of impact from that over time. And so it aged in those barrels for about eight months. The other thing we do that really changes this vignole from other vignole um, people make is that this one goes through malolactic fermentation. So we are actively trying to bring back that acidity and trying to soften the mouthfeel, but not a lot. So we only go through partial. We bring it halfway through malolactic and then stop that fermentation. We don't bring it all the way out. It's not your buttery, oaky Chardonnay. It's got some nice round mouthfeel notes to it because we go through halfway through that malolactic. Yeah, and one of the things, I mean, you can't really do Riesling here in Maryland very well. So it's nice that there is a grape that's, you know, not the same, obviously, but very, very, can be very similar in, in the acid and the, the wine that you get from it. So I think that's, you know, and I, you know, again, I'll ask the same question, you know, maybe your experience is different just based on the history of your winery, but is the, how is it, 
is it difficult to sell the hybrid grape to say a, a quote unquote serious wine drinker? You know, what, what, what do they turn their nose up with about that? And also after that, can you kind of talk about your experience of, of the rebranding you guys have done a, a little bit? In the last yeah, couple? certainly. And they kind of loop into each other. So it's yeah. I was going to talk about it anyway. Um, so yes, it is difficult to, to sell a wine to someone when they don't know how to pronounce it. So <laughs> if you look at this name right here, Vignol, nothing like we hear Vignolis a lot, right? And it's Vignol. Um, we, you know, you, just, you don't want to correct people on how they're pronouncing it, but yet they want to know. Uh, we had the issue with Chamberson as well, that we made two different Chambersons, and we have since taken Chamberson off of our label. We now call it Revolution for our uh, mid-grade, and then our reserve Chamberson is called Aperture. So they're two very different things, but they don't say Chamberson on them. Um, Vignol is the only hybrid we have in our reserve series that actually goes by its name. And we think it's something that you can teach people and people are intrigued by. Um, I will say that it's easier to sell a hybrid when you can do tastings because they can try it and then realize that, oh, this is a good wine. And if they don't turn their nose at it once you know they have a chance to try it themselves. Um, so that's gonna be our challenge moving forward is that we're doing significantly less tastings and we're trying to get people still to come by the wine. Luckily, Vignola has been out on the shelves now for five years as a varietal. So we do have a following of people who know what it is and hopefully they'll help spread the word and do their own tastings with their friends. But um, yeah, it is definitely difficult. And to that point, um, a couple of years ago, right after I started back here, so I finished high school and then I went to, to Cornell and I had my degree in viticulture and analogy. And that was mm -hmm. a four year degree. And then after that, I worked in Illinois and Napa and Kentucky, uh, Indiana, Oregon and New Zealand. And then I came back here in 2017. So when I came back here, my family was already starting and I kind of helped push them to do um, a, an entire rebranding of mm -hmm. our dry wines. So anything with this big L on it, our Lingonor L, is our reserve wines. Everything in here is a state grown, 100% um, handpicked, sorted, treated with, you know, nothing but the utmost respect, coddled like a little baby, you know, all those mm -hmm. things um, that kind of go into making a fine dry, fine dry wine. Um, and we even, as we're trying to rebrand and change perception of our brand, one of the things that we did is there's no Linganore on the front of our label, but you okay. have to turn it to find it on the side. Yeah, I um, the that. only yeah, so the only Linganore on the front is the Linganore AVA, which is what Finn was talking about earlier. That way we can label it as state. You have to put the AVA on the, on the front part of your label. And and you know Linganore and, and Bordy are very similar in a lot of ways where they've had they've gone through these kind of rebranding to be. You know, I don't want to use the term taken seriously, but to, you know, to focus a little bit more on the on the the, the drier wines. Yeah. And, and you know, I guess I will use the term to be more taken more seriously as a, a serious dry wine producer. And I think it's been great to see both wineries succeed in that. I mean, I think the the new branding just looks fantastic on the bottle too. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> and that. you know, I, I you know I think you know your winery was kind of known for the, uh, you know, just the sweet wine. I think for so long. Mm -hmm. And now to see this is really, really great. And I, I, you know, so is there anything specific about this wine you, that you haven't said that you'd like to share? Uh, you know, um, I will say it is, if you haven't tried it before and if it didn't show up in your pack and you're just curious about it, I, I not because I'm trying to sell my own wine, but I would recommend trying Vignol. It is my go-to dry white in the summer. It's got nice acidity. It's bright. It's got no sugar. So you don't feel like your mouth is like tired and sticky after having a glass. Um, it is really accessible as a dry white. It's not over the top. It's very subtle and has got wonderful air. And so, I think, and you know, you're right. The, the the oak treatment does mellow out that acidity a little bit to make mm -hmm. it just even a little bit more. Uh, there's definitely more balance to it. And because uh, I've had a lot of them that are really bracing. And this yeah. is it's not the case with this one. And I think that that's primarily got to be from the oak that you're using. Um, yeah, and, I think it's the oak, and I think the partial malolactic fermentation helps right. quite a lot as well. Yeah, we made a very similar wine at the winery I worked at in southern Indiana, and it didn't quite fold out the same way. Well, good. Well, thanks for sharing. Wonderful wine. Yeah, no problem. Can I ask one question, Melissa? Sure. Was there or was there not a sparkling version of this wine? No. There was but you're not. remembering really close. There is a sparkling version of Alberini. Oh, oh, oh. No, there was three years ago. You're right. Yes. 
Three years ago, we made a wine called Belle Luce that was sparkling. It was released in, it was a 2016. Yes. It was right before I came back. I, I, um, I remember breaking, yeah, I remember calling your, your father and I said, I, I want to talk about this wine. And he, he just said, oh my gosh, to produce a sparkling wine, I don't think we're ever going to do it. And I said, I was calling to tell you that you needed to raise the price because yeah, it's a beautiful wine and whatever effort it took to make that wine, you should be charging handily for it, but beautiful wine. And, and it all, and it all comes from these great grapes and uh, mm -hmm. thanks for keeping the tradition of this, this great variety going. Yeah, no worries. We should probably charge some more for this one too. <laughs> I okay. think we did raise it actually. <laughs> there, there's an endorsement, new, new wine, new label, new price. Exactly. Thanks. Sure. No problem. All right, Michael, where, uh, where to next? Uh, well, let's talk about this wonderful Chardonnay. Let's talk about the Chardonnay. Jason. Hello. And, and again, I'll say the same thing. Since I've uh, messed up the vintages so far, which one are we trying? So this is the 2017 Chardonnay. Okay. Two out, of, two out of five ain't bad. Okay. There you go. <laughs> and, you know, there, there was a sheet, Kevin. It there, it's listed right here. <laughs> Plus, you have the bottle. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Well, thanks. I got to say that I, I have never, I don't think, um, obviously in a competition, I probably tasted it, but I've never, I am kind of a newbie to your wine uh, and this one, this brand. And I, I'm just was kind of blown away tasting this today um, that it, it's just fantastic. I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound hyperbolic here, but this wine is really fantastic. Um, so can tell me a little bit about the vineyards. I mean, how many acres do you, are under vine there? How much of it is Chardonnay? Um, when was it planted? And anything else you might want to share about the actual grapes? So you're right. The winery is somewhat new. It's not brand new. The vines were planted in 2011. First harvest of the grapes was in 2014. Those got sold to another winery. And then the first vintage that was put into bottle under the Antietam Creek label was 2015. So this is the third vintage of this wine here. And uh, the vineyard is four acres, so not very big, but it's it's maintained like a garden and that's one of the reasons that the, the wine is so good is because uh, the owners do a very good job in maintaining um, the, the vineyard. It's, uh, it's a beautiful vineyard and the Chardonnay is about maybe 20% of that vineyard. It's in my mind, it's a few rows um, and it's our flagship white wine. And we didn't know that going into the first vintage, we didn't know how all these wines would, would come out in the bottle. So uh, this wasn't intended to be the flight of the wine. It turned out that way. Yeah. Hang on, sorry, someone's saying. Sorry. <laughs> Got rid of that, sorry about that. No problem. Uh, it turns out this is just a good site for Chardonnay. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it's such a good site. It, it just is. And uh, the winemaking is, uh, nothing special. It's just traditional Burgundian winemaking. You know, we're not trying to imitate any particular style. Uh, how it's come out is is somewhat Burgundian. I mean, it's it's definitely not a California style wine. Uh, it's it's not quite French, but it's probably closer to French in style, the Burgundian style, uh, than anything else. But you know, it's I always find it uh, you know a little funny when people ask what what style of wine. Do you make an Antietam Creek? The answer is that we make Antietam Creek style wine mm -hmm. uh, because you can't fight terroir. It, you know, that will be an overwhelming influence on the wine. So the wines are how they were always meant to be. And that is uh, Western Maryland style Chardonnay. Uh, in this particular case, you know, this unique site that we have, uh, it just turns out to be uh, uh, one of the better sites for Chardonnay. Um, so the winemaking, like I mentioned, nothing special on it. It's barrel, whole cluster pressed, barrel fermented. We use 100% French oak, um, but very little new French oak. And I'm, you know, I haven't had this wine in about a year, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm smelling it. I'm tasting it. I'm trying to find the oak in this wine, and I'm, I'm having to search pretty hard and. Yeah, it's and that's on, not mixed, yeah. And 
you know, oak should be something that influences a wine, but doesn't define the wine. And so, you know, when you're making wine for a new winery, you're not really sure how the wine's going to turn out. You have a pretty good idea, but ultimately you, you don't really know. And so this is 20% new French oak. Um, so not a lot, I mean, just a little bit. Um, uh, so the idea is that the oak contributes to uh, the structure of the wine, but it doesn't define the wine. The you know the terroir and uh, the vineyard site define the wine. The winemaking uh, you know just helps usher that along. And do you always tend to blend in a little pinot with with this, or was it just unique <laughs> to that year? Because I know it's eleven percent pinot pinot noir. So the pinot is a is a nursery accident, and okay. uh, instead of not doing anything with the wine. Uh, what we did is um, uh, we whole cluster pressed that, but we kept it separate from the Chardonnay and it turned out to be a pink wine. And then uh, it was fined rather heavily and that makes a, a white wine. And it really has no place in any other wine in the winery um, as a blender. The only place it might have is in the Chardonnay. And this is the last vintage with that wine. Um, in, Subsequent vintages, we've we've turned it into a rosé. Uh, it's uh, it's okay. It was fun to try it, but it really belongs somewhere else other than a, a Chardonnay varietal <laughs> bottle. Unless, unless you're going to turn it into a, a sparkling, which you know, which I think that it could this uh, you know the grapes just from what I'm tasting this wine could certainly lend themselves to that. But that's that's a whole other issue, <laughs> a whole other thing. Um, so. Does, is there just this one Chardonnay? Is there, uh, I know you all, there's only the, uh, it's very small. Is there a 100% stainless Chardonnay that's on at the winery or just this one? No, just this one. I think as the business grows and hopefully as plantings follow, one of the things I'd like to see is more Chardonnay vines and also a, a stainless Chablis style Chardonnay. Uh, but at this point, the uh, the production level is too low. We just have this one wine here. Uh, we have a, a question here. Do um, do you know what kind of soil this is? Uh, this Chardonnay is growing in is it is it clay or limestone? Uh, yes, uh, limestone and loam. Um, I don't think there's a lot of clay in there, uh, but yes, uh, limestone and, and loam. Um, you know, it, it's hard to. You know, that's one of the. You know, philosophical questions of you know what contributes to the character of the wine and you know as i taste wines throughout the state and throughout the region you know, a question i always have in the back of my mind is how did this wine turn out this way you know of course site is directing the uh, the wine but what is it about the site and i don't know that any of us have a conclusive answer to that is does the character of the soil influence the taste of the wine well maybe um you know it's a piece of the puzzle so to the extent that the soil influences the wine it probably does so in uh, less dramatic ways as opposed to actively being a, a component of the taste um, i think you know the how the soil drains is probably the Im biggest impact for the quality of the wine you know not keeping that soil too wet uh, beyond that, you know, no one really knows, you know, everyone always says, well, limestone for Chardonnay, and, you know, clay for Merlot. That's, there's something to that. Sure. And I, I have one last question for you, and it's about Chardonnay yeah. in general. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, I, you know, maybe it's played out now, but there's been a lot of backlash of, of, with the grape over the years, uh, you know, because of the, you know, the hugely butterscotchy and overdone, if you will, California versions that they that they've moved that industry has moved away from but do you, do you think there's that you know making a wine like this will help contribute to that to erase that stigma that you know you're like you said you're closer to the old world world style and you know do you people do you get people that say oh, well i don't like chardonnay and then they'll have this and then well i like this yes uh that happens all the time uh more so years ago, I think that stigma has gone away because I think yeah. California has largely gone away from making that style of wine. Right. Um, but yes, you know, those memories will last a lot longer than these wines <laughs> do. Uh, 
Uh, and so, yes, it does happen, you know, anything but Chardonnay, no, wait, try this, you know, and then we'll get some converts to the Chardonnay. Uh, I have to yeah, live in, in a little insular world where most of the Chardonnay I drink is from this region, so. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a great region for Chardonnay and it not, it, you know, it's funny, it, a lot of wineries are growing Chardonnay, making Chardonnay and selling Chardonnay, but not a lot of wineries are talking about it. And it certainly mm -hmm. doesn't get the buzz in the industry the right. way that, you know, like Viognier does in Virginia, it gets a lot of buzz, uh, but not Chardonnay. And I'm not quite sure why, um, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons for it. What I can say is I think this is a dynamite variety for the region. Mm -hmm. It grows well. Uh, and this, I was looking back through my notes here. I haven't looked at these notes in years, but I, um, I, I normally push ripeness on Chardonnay. And I've, uh, one winery, winery I used to work at, I actually used to push it to the second week of October. Um, oh, wow. And that was site directed. It just took that long to ripen. It wasn't any particular, you know, extensive ripeness on it. But, uh, you know, uh, one of the questions before with uh, one of the panelists was, uh, talking about the vintage and you know we all remember 2017 as a great vintage and looking at my notes we harvested this the second week of september uh, which is probably the earliest i've ever harvested chardonnay and it was harvested at 23 bricks so 23 bricks for the second week of september is is great i mean normally uh, you may never get that or you're you're really pushing ripeness mm -hmm. into the Definitely. maybe the fourth week of september uh, so great vintage, very dry. I remember it specifically uh, because uh, <laughs> I was out there harvesting fruit one day. I was uh, I harvested the Vidal, and it was just this gorgeous October day. Uh, but yeah, seventeen was uh, a wonderful vintage. Yeah, I've, I've heard that from a lot of different winemakers on the west on the east coast for sure, mm -hmm. particularly the Mid Atlantic region. Well, thanks again, wonderful wine. I'm glad you got to revisit it with us today. Um, Thank you. I, I, I'm certainly going to be getting uh, coming out and trying to get more of your uh, of the wines there after having this. I can tell you that. Right. Thank you, Kevin. Michael. Hey. Oh, hey. So um, I'll put a plug in for the tasting barn, the tasting room at Antietam Creek Vineyards. It is literally looking over Antietam Battleground, and it's one thing to walk up into the tasting room, but then they pull the big barn door open and you are, you know, two flights above looking out over the, the battlefield and it's, it's stunning. So very, very cool. The wines are great. Um, we have two other wines to taste that, uh, that, that we have missing panelists for. So the first right, is one. Pinot Grigio from Sugarloaf Mountain Vineyard. 2017, just so you know. <laughs> Got that one right. It's as if I was guessing. <laughs> so, so you know, I would normally think uh, 2017 would be on the tail end of a Pinot Grigio's. Yeah, that's what I thought when I first saw the lifespan. And and then what do you, what do you think? What do you got? Well, I as I texted you earlier, I was surprised that, that the word I used was how zippy this was because yeah. uh, you know I would think that something that has been in the bottle um, for this grape at least this, this long might have lost some of that. Um, liveliness to it and this one hasn't at all yeah but it's it's still there so uh the wine the winemaker manolo um mm -hmm. has done really really great things with uh, this grape and they have a killer chardonnay as well and have uh some really really nice reds varietals reserves and then red blends as well um but I hear a lot about this wine. People really, really, I'm not sure where it ranks in their sales, but we hear a lot about their Pinot Grigio and it does very well in our competitions. And, um, and I think this is why it's just really bright, really fresh, perfect for a night like tonight. And I, I mean, I think uh, you would probably know about this better than me, but I think that I remember when this winery opened and yeah. how it was kind of almost like the start of a renaissance, if you will, in the industry. And I think this, they, you know, them opening, was they were one of the first and then you know black ankle follow and now yep. you see you know all the wineries like the two we talked to today lingonor and Bordy, who have been 
rebrand themselves in, in a way that really as um really shows what the state can do and it's really been nice to watch as you know you certainly watch it more than i do but i think it's it's you know this winery shows that you know that they could this they just kind of showed what could have been done in maryland and then everybody followed and yeah I, and 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 this was uh i believe this was the first full vineyard and winery in montgomery county and now yeah, right yeah. around right around them in the ag reserve you've got uh four others coming on online including uh, you know, Old Westminster has their new Burnt Hill uh, project there. Um, Vineyard 61 is another one. Uh, there's a couple others that are, are in the works and uh, just didn't realize it was a great grape growing area. But now we do. Yeah, it's the Clarksburg area is really yep. where this is. But yeah, this is, I was really pleasantly surprised. To, and obviously you wouldn't have included it if it didn't, in this package, if it didn't still have some life to it. But I mean, right. I think it's, you know, it just shows that this grape can actually do last beyond, uh, you know, a, it's what you would think. I mean, usually I don't drink, we don't drink much Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio here, but usually it's quite quickly that it is consumed. And I think that's what uh, people think of. And, you know, I guess we should say that, you know, people ask, well, what's Pinot Grigio versus Pinot Gris? It is the same right. grape. It's just the style that it's made. The Pinot Grigio is made kind of the in, more in the Italian style where Pinot Gris is made in the French style. Yep. Uh, I, you know, I think it's because I think we've seen wineries move away from Pinot Grigio and they're kind of going towards the Pinot Gris style. But, you know, this reminds me that this is it's still a great wine. And it's a perfect wine, like you said, for a Tuesday night sitting yeah. outside. <laughs> and what it's made about, you know, low 80s, it's warm, but not it's we're lucky that it's not incredibly humid tonight. Right. Otherwise, it would be outside. Um, yeah, yeah it's a great supper time white wine. It's a great wine, and, and uh, thanks for, for tasting along with that. Uh, and thanks, Sugarloaf and Manolo, for including that one. Um, we and have the Cool Ridge is the last one. Yeah, Cool Ridge is a relatively new vineyard, and it's also out in Washington County. So we've got uh, some Western Maryland, uh, Southern Maryland, Central Maryland wines here on this panel. Um, cool Ridge... Uh, and I should also say that we've we've got a couple of Governor's Cup winners on this on this uh, on this panel as well. So um, retro, congrats to everybody for doing that. I'll say Cool Ridge is another one. Uh, one of their red blends, the Cool Red, won the Governor's Cup, I believe, three years ago, and that was just a, a really pretty, um, you know, French French style Bordeaux blend. Um, and they're kind of taking a little riff off of that with a white blend. So this is the Cool White. Mm -hmm. And do you have the composition in front of you? Yeah, it's uh, it's twenty five percent each Viognier, Pinot Gris, Riesling, and Traminette, which are uh, you know we haven't talked about three of those grapes at all on this um, this tasting. And I, I did mention Riesling. There's not a lot of Riesling in in Maryland at all. Uh, there's I think I've only had one or two varietal Rieslings from Maryland over right. the years. Uh, the newest being the Old Westminster one that they just did, uh, which was actually quite nice, um, but. I think I, I specifically am not a fan of Traminette in general. And so whenever I have a wine that has Traminette, it's the first thing I pick up. And I'm really getting that here. I mean, I, I, which is funny because I love Gewurztraminer. Um, but, you know, obviously any, when you're judging a wine competition, you don't yeah. take your personal preference into account. You think you take, you know, right whether the wine's done well or not. And this is obviously done well. Um, but that's the first thing I'm getting on the nose. So you get some of the Traminette. I, I smell a little bit of the Riesling. But I think that it's a really interesting blend. I don't think I've seen a blend like this before. And when you taste it, you can you can see hints of them. Nothing is clearly coming through no. to me. But, but the, um, the, I mean, usually, yeah, you're not, you're not blending really any of these grapes ever together. Right. Um, so that's that makes this unique. And I can see how... You know, looking at it, 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 this wine has won a couple of comp uh, competitions, including the um, best of category for white uh, blends in the Atlantic Seaboard competition, which is no slouch. So, uh, you know, I think that, and it says here, a unique taste of its own, and that's certainly true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, we didn't, but again, we didn't talk about these grapes. And I think, you know, I talked about how we talked about how great Albarino and how great Chardonnay is in Maryland, but. Um, you know, I don't. I think of these four. I think Pinot Gris is the one, and we, since we just said the Pinot Grigio too, I think Pinot Gris is the one you, that probably might be more successful in Maryland. And you're seeing some Viognier, but I, 
Um, I, I think Viognier might be a hard grape, a harder grape to sell on people. Um, and, you know, Virginia kind of hung their hat on it. Um, but, you know, I could see why this would be a, a very popular wine. There's, you know, the tiny, it's just that super tiny bit of residual sugar, which probably comes from the Traminette. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, another great wine to have on a, a night like tonight that would pair with any of the seafood from Maryland. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's another good, uh, food pairing. Um, so with that, and, and, and thank you for, for going through that. I'm sorry that, uh, Gary and Suzanne couldn't join us for that. Um, I did want to, I'll, I'll warn the panel. I'm going to bring you all back up. And uh, we can close out if anybody has any final comments about any white wines, what the future is, et cetera. So in no particular order, the green team is back on the screen. Why don't we just go in the order that we, we did, Finn? What did you uh, am I just riffing here? Yeah, yeah. sure. What, what's, <laughs> what, what, what's the future? What's next in terms of uh, white wines from your perspective? Oh, boy. Well, um, uh, I am particularly interested in a variety called Petit Mansang. I don't know if anyone here grows it, but we have uh, about 25 vines that we planted, uh, just an experimental little thing a couple of years ago, and I love it. I, we haven't made any wine out of it yet, but in the vineyard, I just love it. It's a bulletproof variety. It holds its acid. It gets really ripe. Again, it's a wine you can do, a grape you can do a lot with. Um, I know a lot of wineries in Virginia use it for late harvest. Uh, it's a good blending grape. Um, you can make it dry. You can make it sweet. It's, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. As I said, we're, once we get some more ground, we're going to probably plant some, uh, maybe just do a half acre or so, you know, baby steps. And um, so, yeah, I would say that's, that's, one, that's one to look out for. That's great. I see a question here from Skip Stewart. Does anyone have Pinot Blanc planted? There is some Pinot Blanc planted. Um, there's some that I think might last year have have uh, been harvested. Does anyone else know? I'm not sure. I was going to say is the variety that I'm interested in planting for whites would be Pinot Blanc. Um, I've tried a lot of really great ones yeah. recently and thought that they would do really well on our site. And we still have several um, open acres that we can plant. Um, so I've thought of that. I think low planted Pinot Blanc or they're going to be planting Pinot Blanc. Um, I don't think they've harvested yet. I know there's some not in Allegheny County as well where, where okay. a grower is growing Pinot Blanc and Pinot Noir and a couple of other um, varieties and, and having fairly good success with it. Nice. I think Joe Fiola doesn't he have some in one of his vineyards? Yeah, and that, and that's where I tried the the yeah little, yeah. And I was really impressed by it. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah I also loved his Marsan. Yeah, <laughs> Marsan Marsan. Yeah, Jason Bob. I'm I'm seeing good things with Albarino at Antietam okay. Creek. Um, it uh, makes a it's a versatile wine. It makes a good wine, a barrel fermented or stainless fermented. We do it stainless at Antietam, but uh, it's a it's a fun wine to make. Uh, you harvest it early, so it uh, misses a lot of the fungal disease pressure later in the season. Um, it's got some nice acidity to it when you harvest it early, and some wonderful floral aromas that uh, you don't find in any other variety. I see Judy Crow uh, from Crow Vineyards has chimed in saying the Chateau Boudet has some um, Pinot Blanc, which is great. I knew that, but had forgotten that. Oh, speaking of Chateau Boudet, I wanted to do a shout out for Sauvignon Blanc. When I was there two years ago for the same um, wine summit, like I, I was extremely impressed by the Sauvignon Blanc that they had there. I think that that has pretty good potential here in Maryland. And not the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc when I worked at Ville Maria. The nice Sauvignon Blanc, you know, the French style. Um, I think that's got some really good potential here in the room as well. Well, we're going to do a cameo. I'm so <laughs> sorry. She was crying. She wants to go out. She's tired of me talking. <laughs> <laughs> Her name's proof, Echo, by the way. Pr proof that we're uh, we're running long. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Bob, I'm I'm really excited about our Chenin Blanc. Yeah, it um it's it's performing well here, but uh, we find that we have to harvest it early. Um, 
It tends to want to go south on us real quick uh, at the end. Um, we're not getting high bricks out of it, but we're getting tremendous flavor. Um, and that's that's what we're shooting for. Um, looking for the, for the nice flavors and uh, we harvest it when it tells us to, believe me. <laughs> There's no letting it hang for another week because we want to let it hang for another week. Now, when, it, when it's ready, you have to bring it in. Yeah. And um, our results are, are, are very nice. Um, almost, our, we just released our, actually this weekend, we're releasing our Rooted, which is 100% uh, uh, Chenin Blanc. Um, and we've had to, had to pull it a little early um, last year. But we, it almost made a verde out of it. It's got almost a green hint. It's 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 beautiful. I, I, don't know, I uh, did, did you get to try any of it, Kevin? I, I sent not, some with. Uh, not yet. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to meet up. Yeah, on I, I won't I won't tell on Jenna if she didn't give it to you. But uh, Jenna, no, she warned uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> and the bubbly, yeah, that's coming at you too. Um, but. Um, just uh, blending of the whites. Uh, we, we don't have a white blend, and this was the first year we actually did a dedicated white blend. And I, I think, uh, you know, blending whites with, as, as in the same mindset as we blend reds um, is a whole other avenue for us here in Maryland. Yeah, that's great. No, I, I, I think white blends, th there's a lot of potential in white blends. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gives you a little bit of flexibility too. So, um, Michael, any any closing thoughts? Uh, I just, I, sorry, I, I dropped out there for a minute. Sorry That's all right. That. I had to switch to my phone just for the end here. But uh, you know, I, I would, you know, I'm, I think, you know, we talked about Albarino before, and I think how that was maybe five or six years ago. That was kind of the new um, thing that is going really well for. Uh, wineries in Maryland and in the Mid-Atlantic, and I'm, I'd like to see stuff like Chenin Blanc being planted or Pinot Blanc, and uh, just trying these new grapes to see what's going to work. And you know, Finn mentioned Petit Van Sang. If you look at the past Governor's Cup winners, the Governor's Case, if, as they call it, in Virginia, the last few years, most of the white wines you've seen are, are Petit Van Sang. Um, so that is uh, what that grape can do, I think, in the just oh yeah technology so so let me let me just close up by thanking everybody for joining and and for contributing such well for making great wines and then and then uh adding those to our wine packs people who chose the white dry white wine pack got lucky I think with some of these. So um, thank you all for joining. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank Hope to have you on again soon. All right. And of course, thanks to Michael Kaiser who co-hosted this and we, uh, we, we love the work that wine America does and we love their support of the whole wine industry. And with that, I wanted to thank everybody for tuning in and uh, encourage you to please stay in touch with Maryland Wine. You can learn all about Maryland Wine at MarylandWine.com. Uh, we've got some exciting new things happening uh, uh, this late summer and fall. Might even get back into having an event or two in a safe, socially distant, masked manner. Um, but we'll, we'll figure out how all that is done. And uh, with that, thank you to everyone for joining in.